This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of June 29th, 2020. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, also on the new Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, a new paper provides insight from a global perspective on who opposes resource distribution approaches like Alaska's PFD and why. Second, two new industry papers help pinpoint the challenges Alaska will face in coming years in continuing to attract oil industry investment. And third, our thoughts on a structured way to evaluate every candidate's fiscal position this election cycle on a common basis. And now, let's join Michael. Welcome back to the program, The Michael Duke Show, Common Sense Radio. We're going to jump into it now. Our weekly guest is Brad Keithley from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. He comes on board to talk with us about, uh, well, sustainable budgets and other things. It's what Jeremy in the chat room calls the most negative, even though it's realistic, outlook you'll hear on radio. <laughs> the most negative but realistic outlook on radio, and that's what Brad has got to start. That's what you got to work with today, my friend. People are preparing for a beating. They're all sheltered in place and hunkered down, waiting for you to start wailing on them with some truth, and uh, and then they're going to have to deal with the out uh, the outpouring of that. So, how are you doing today? <laughs> I'm doing great, Michael. And you know, sort of. So let's step back to 2013 and look what's happened to us uh, when when you and I started about in that time frame, and look what's happened to us over the, over this period of time. I, yeah, it's it's realistic, and yeah, it's negative. But you know, we need to understand the, the 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 fiscal situation and the oil and gas situation that we face. We don't need to be, you know, pie in the sky about it. That's what that's what that's what happened to twenty billion dollars in savings uh, over that eight year period. We kept thinking that you know the it was going to be pie in the sky and the clouds are going to clear and it was going to be a golden day again. And we just need to spend a little bit more savings to to get us there. And we ran through all of it. You know, thinking that uh, thinking that the clouds were going to part. So I, we need to be realistic. That's, right. that's what that's what this segment is about. Yep, we need some realism. There's no there's no doubt about that. Um, all right. Well, let's uh, let's get things started this morning. Um, we've talked a lot about how the taking of the PFD and how those uh, cash, you know, that direct dividend to the people uh, is has is really a threat to many of those in the top twenty percent and higher. Uh, that they see it as the cash cow, and they, of course, don't want to have their uh, monies taken. And that's now being echoed uh, partially around the world. Um, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about that. So the Baker Institute, which is a, which is a, a, a an institute down at Rice University, has been publishing uh, a, a very well respected uh, institute on uh, natural resource and. And uh, and and various matter and and, and uh, uh, energy and and climate uh, and and various matters. The Baker Institute has been publishing a series of papers on uh, FDI, foreign direct investment, uh, in uh, in in countries, uh, in parts of countries um, uh, by uh, resource companies, uh, extractive companies coming into. Various regions and uh, and and the impact that they have and the rules that they ought to be following and sort of best practice and and what the consequences of that foreign direct investment has been and it's not only been the the, the study has not only been on the foreign direct investment in uh, Africa or in developing countries there's also been there's also a paper on the impact 
of essentially foreign direct investment in the Permian Basin. If you just, if you if you define foreign direct investment as as investment coming from outside a region into a region, what the impact uh, on that region region is. One of the papers they published uh, is by uh, a guy by the name of Todd Moss, uh, who uh, those who are familiar with the PFD will know Todd's name. He's been around for a long time. Uh, studied the, the the permanent fund uh, dividend, studied Alaska, studied the impact on Alaska, but but more broadly, Todd has also been in the forefront of of studying uh, uh, other forms of permanent fund dividends throughout the world and the impact on regions uh, where there is a lot of foreign direct investment, a lot of a lot of wealth generated from that region, and where there isn't um, uh, hasn't been a um, uh, permanent fund dividend of sharing with uh, with individuals, and he published a paper earlier this year. Uh, the Baker Institute uh, published a paper earlier this year by Todd that says that, that's titled "Resource Curse Dynamics: The Corporate License to Operate and the Potential for Direct Cash Dividends." Uh, I've posted it on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page, and I think it's a great uh, for those who are interested in the PFD. It's a great uh, study. About the impact of the of the PFD on, on in in various regions, and there's a lot of really uh, interesting um, uh, findings that that Todd has uh, in the paper. Uh, one, for example, is is something that we debate a lot in Alaska about whether what what the PFD does, what the whether it's generating uh, 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 income, generating uh, economic activity in Alaska, or whether it's being wasted. Um, and Todd cites studies from other regions uh, to the point that he says evidence from cash transfer programs in Latin America and Africa, for example, suggests that most of the cash is spent wisely, that it boosts consumer demand, and that general positive multiplier effects it generates uh, uh, positive multiplier effects throughout the economy. Right. The dividend can also provide funds for entrepreneurial efforts by a recipient who cannot tap the banking system for funds. And thus can provide income growth in the country from the from the bottom up. And there's there's several other findings that Scott or that Todd has in here uh, that I think are very supportive of of issues that we face uh, that we face in Alaska, uh, and 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 draws on evidence from other regions. One of his conclusions, though, really struck home with me, uh, as it usually does when I read his stuff. But he had he it, it was. It was phrased perhaps more directly in this report than I've seen him uh, write about it before. And, and it was this statement, direct cash dividends may be seen as a threat to privileged elites in countries with a long entrenched re regime where distribution of oil is the principal source of patronage or the means of maintaining power. And that's, you know, economists maybe, maybe you know, uh, uh, respond to that statement better. It's, it's, in, it's in a little bit uh, uh, obscure language. But basically what Todd is saying is where there are direct cash dividends, it's viewed by the ruling elites, the political power, if you will, uh, as a threat because politic, the political power wants to have – all of that money for itself, all of those revenues for itself, because then it uh, decides where the money goes. It decides who, who benefits and who doesn't. Uh, that the political power, the political elites decide um, uh, how it's spent. And most importantly, the political elites don't have to contribute to revenues because they have they have all of this revenue coming in from the natural resource. Um, and they can, they, they will say, well, these are these are the government programs we should be pursuing. We can pay for them all out of these out of these oil rents, um, and we really don't have to contribute ourselves. Uh, the political elites contribute themselves uh, to the program. We'll decide who's good, and we'll decide who's bad, uh, and um, and we'll keep that power and and make those decisions ourselves. And they view. What Todd's saying, from a global perspective, is is the political elites view dividend programs as a challenge to that because it's taking a portion of the revenues and giving it directly to the citizens, 
uh, and allowing citizens to make those decisions about where to sp- spend the money as opposed to the political uh, elites. And that's I, I, reading that uh, just you know struck home again that that's exactly what we're facing in Alaska. Uh, we've got a situation where uh, the, the political power system, uh, the privileged elites, uh, have developed a system where uh, uh, the, the legislature, the political power, makes the decisions about where the, where the oil revenues have gone historically. And they've, they've been able to satisfy their desires and their programs uh, up, until, up until 2016. They were able to satisfy it through the oil, the, the portion of the oil rents that went to government through royalties and through, uh, through production taxes. But in 2016, we found that, uh, that, that they no longer could satisfy those desires simply through uh, taking what historically had been the government's share of the oil rents uh, and distributing it uh, and, and using it to, to satisfy their, their political objectives. Right. They then they, they they came to the point where they realized they needed other sources of revenues. And whether and, and rather than contribute to the costs of government themselves, uh, or create a system where they would contribute to the cost of government themselves, or pull back their political power and reduce spending, they started diverting revenues from, that otherwise were intended for um, uh, citizens. Uh, it back into the political power structure and using that to continue to control, continue to direct uh, 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 their programs uh, without having to pay for the pay for it themselves. So it's um, it, it's a confirmation, if you will. A Todd study, Todd Moss's study, to me is a confirmation of of exactly what's going on here. It's it's a confirmation from a global perspective, looking at how these programs operate globally. It's a confirmation from a global perspective uh, of what we're seeing uh, seeing in Alaska, and that is the political elites, the, the top 20 percent, the legislature, however you want to describe it, um, uh, const- uh, uh, fighting efforts to to take money out of their 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 control, uh, take money away from where they want to direct patronage, take money away from the programs that they want to fund, fighting fighting that. Uh, by by now just taxing citizens and taking money away from citizens to keep uh, to keep the political elites in control. Yeah, the interesting part, I mean, having read through this piece, I will say that the most interesting part comes after his discussion of the permanent fund, where he talks about the effects and evidence of the benefits of cash, and he's talking specifically about South African and Mexico and and Latin American countries, but he talks specifically about how cash reduces poverty narrows inequality, it enables consumption and risk-taking, it strengthens the social contract. He goes through piece by piece and shows how money in the hands of the citizens is the best, highest use of that money versus everything you just talked about where the elites are basically, again, taking control of it and deciding for their own selves. This, again, is the problem that I've been talking about where we know better than you how to spend this money, you poor, poor, pitiful peasants, and uh, we know how to do this. And and, he, and and history shows exactly the opposite. Getting that money into the hands of the citizens stimulates the economy, reduces poverty, uh, you know, creates jobs, creates entrepreneurship, does all these different things. And, uh, I mean, there's just proof positive. Proof is in the pudding. And, and they got to quit trying to feed the beast and instead give that money to the people. Yeah, and I, and I think, Michael, I, I, another piece of that, I mean, I, it's the same piece, um, Things that things that we don't think about in Alaska. There are other programs like the permanent fund dividend elsewhere in the world. We've I think we've talked previously on the show about the Osage Nation uh, in Oklahoma has essentially a permanent fund dividend program out of oil rents that the that the nation receives from uh, uh, royalties uh, on production from uh, from nation lands. Uh, but Todd goes through other examples. Bolivia, uh, he said, has a program. Brazil has a program. Mexico has a as a program, and on and on, and and from these programs, they've been able to look at the impact. This is just, just taking it entirely out of the Alaska context. From these programs, they've been able to look at the impact, um, and and yes, they they will find a portion of the dollars uh, or of the revenues that are that are may, may be misspent, right, um, or maybe spent on on things that people would consider. 
uh, unproductive. Right. But but by and large, from these other programs, they've found that they've had the impacts you were you were just talking about. So it isn't you know sometimes in Alaska we get into these. Uh, these d- debates, I, I know that we had one in the last legislature about. Well, I can't find any, I can't find any jobs bump uh, that uh, that comes from the PFD. You know, you look what happens in October. You would think that all that revenue coming in, we'd have a jobs bump. We don't find a, a jobs bump, uh, and so the PFD must. And so the, con- the conclusion that some leap to, those that want to cut the PFD is that, well, there's there's no economic impact to the PFD. It really doesn't hurt if we divert, divert it back to government. And look, we get all these jobs, these government jobs. By diverting it back to back to government, we can employ more people and, and divert it to things that the government thinks uh, is good. But what Todd brings to the brings to the table, I think, in this study is is look at Bolivia, look at Mexico, look at, look at Brazil, look at the impacts in, in the other places that he mentions. Look at the impacts uh, that, the, that the PFD has uh, or the PFD equivalents have had in those places. Take it outside the Alaska con- context, and you find that there is uh, uh, positive effects uh, uh, from those programs. And I think that's the sort of stuff that we need to bring back from um, from Todd's study, from global studies, and say, look at this Alaska. I mean, you know, we're so myop- myopic here. We're trying to, you know, piece together employment impacts. Uh, from from these expenditures, let's look let's look at on the broader scale what happens in other countries, and then let's see if you know that applies to Alaska as well. Brad, quick tease on number two. Uh, there have been a couple of articles this past week about oil development issues. Uh, one particularly on Alaska, one uh, more broadly about what's going on uh, in oil investments that I think are. Uh, uh, to borrow a phrase, must reads uh, for those interested in, uh, in in where Alaska may be headed and where oil investment in Alaska may be headed. Summarize these two articles real quick for us uh, so we can see if we can get on to number three here before we run out of daylight. Well, th- there's two articles. One is an, uh, one is a piece in, uh, in, a, in a publication called Energy Intelligence Finance, which uh, follows the, the financial aspects of the industry clo- closely. Uh, and the second is a piece by... Um, uh, somebody who's familiar with Alaska, Nikos Safos, um, uh, in the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Headline is, Will the New Funding Rules Kill Alaska's Oil Boom? Talking about the, talking about the um, uh, 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 banks uh, that have uh, adopted uh, uh, new, new standards or new, new rules that uh, uh, tend to um, discriminate against Alaska. Both of these sort of come to this come to the same place. Uh, the the, the, the write-downs articles, the one in the uh, energy intelligence finance, sort of looks at what BP's done in terms of write-down in, in write down of reserves and in terms of in, in what others have done. Shell announced one uh, today, a huge write-down, $20 billion plus uh, write-down uh, in its reserves. Uh, and basically, uh, this the, this piece comes to a conclusion of, of three things: uh, exploration likely becomes more even more selective and scarce. That as uh, oil companies face the uh, the prospect of of having hit peak oil or soon to hit peak oil, uh, and now there's more oil reserves identified than there is remaining market, um, that they 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 become much more selective about about uh, new exploration projects, uh, and, and the money for that uh, becomes much more scarce. Second, uh, the definition of top-tier projects could evolve as, finan- as fiscal terms and spending needs shift just because you have a project today uh, that, uh, that's been identified. That project may not be funded uh, as, uh, as, as dollars, as the available dollars uh, look for look at uh, the potential for uh, peak oil and declining demand and and trying to find that money moving around trying to find what best fits uh, the, the the projects that best fit uh, that uh, that environment and the third and and important to Alaska as well the third point out of the energy intelligence article is development cycle times will compress um, and what they're basically saying is these long lead long li- long lead uh, projects uh, where you find a, a project today, and you know, 15 years later, or 10 years later, or even five years later, you're able to develop it. Those projects will take a backseat to what are called short cycle projects, 
because short cycle projects enable you to get in when it, when you have a reasonable uh, view of what the of what the oil environment is going to be, the oil pricing environment is going to be, and the oil demand environment is going to be. Get in, develop the project, uh, get your oil in a fairly you know, short time frame. Um, and uh, and and not be exposed to having invested a whole bunch of money, a huge amount of money in a in a project, uh, only to find out that the oil market has changed by the time you finally are able to to bring it to market. Right. Um, and then Nikos, uh, uh, in his piece, uh, talks about uh, the the bank rules. Basically, picks through the bank rules and says uh, they're really not uh, uh, preventing. Uh, funding from the big banks uh, into Alaska projects. The banks don't want to be associated with funding projects that say I'm an Alaska project or I'm an Arctic project. Uh, they don't want to be. They don't want to directly funnel into a project that does that. But they're but they're the banks are still open to funding uh, oil and gas companies. They haven't foreclosed that. And if an oil and gas company happens to have an Arctic project, uh, then then they're not prohibiting the funding that they're giving the company generally from being used in connection with generally commingled and used in connection with the Arctic project. So he picks, he, he picks through the rules and says that it's okay. But, uh, at the, at the end, he comes to the same sort of conclusion that Alaska is going to be challenged, uh, not, so, not as much by the banks, uh, but by the economics and the shifts that are going on, um, in the oil market generally. That uh, that that among other things, uh, bank or companies are going to be looking at risks, uh, time risks, delay risks, uh, feeding back into the first article, um, and Alaska has a lot of those risks, and other projects uh, don't have as big a risk. Right. Combined, those two articles, I think, say that that Alaska is it, we're just moving into um, an increasingly difficult. Uh, uh, investment climate uh, and an increasingly difficult uh, development climate, um, and 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 that says the same. That says to me the same thing that we've talked about previously on the program. We need to be doing everything we can in Alaska to tamp down risk, to tamp down uh, uh, economic impacts, adverse economic impacts on companies, uh, in order to maintain uh, the economic attractive the the the, the attractiveness of Alaska to uh, to investment dollars. And we've had a long discussion about all the new banking rules. We did a show on that here probably three, four weeks ago where we went through each and every one of these things and how it's affecting Alaskan uh, investment and how it's going to be more difficult moving forward to try and, um, you know, from a from a uh, uh, imaging perspective as how banks are going to want to tackle these Arctic projects for sure. So you can go back and take a look at that uh, and or take a listen to that uh, as well before. Um, which takes us to number three. Uh, budgets this election cycle, how we're looking at it. You've come up with kind of a chart that you think uh, kind of covers uh, a lot of those things. Let's talk about that. Well, as a result of, of conversations on this show and elsewhere, uh, I've been trying to come up with a template, if you will, uh, uh, for uh, to, to look at candidates for me that enables me to look at candidates and sort of evaluate how those candidates are uh, positioning themselves or positioning what what they're articulating as positions for the state, how that fits with economic uh, economic reality. And the latest iteration of, of doing that is a chart that I developed uh, last week uh, for that sort of says this is how this is this is what we're facing in the FY22 budget. Here are the steps uh, that we have to take uh, to or here's here's the numbers we have to hit. Uh, to make that budget uh, work uh, in an environment where we no longer have savings. Um, and so it's a template for me and, and, and others uh, to look at what candidates are saying uh, and evaluate, evaluate the candidates. Basically, the starting, the starting point is, 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 is two things. One, spending capped at no greater than uh, inflation sort of takes what uh, – the, the the legislation that's been uh, uh, bouncing around the the legislature for the past couple of years that says we're going to cap spending at inflation takes that uh, and adopts that and says okay well spending cap at inflation is going to be about 4.6 billion dollars that's that's where that's the starting point and then it looks on the revenue side and says okay what's the starting point on the revenue side 
Uh, traditional revenues, this is from the spring revenue forecast, traditional revenues are about $1.3 billion. Um, the, the, the amount from the POMV looks at current law. Uh, SB 23 says this is we're going to only draw so much from the from the permanent fund, um, and then existing law on the on the statutory dividend says we're, that a portion of that goes to the dividend under law under current law, um, and the revenues that are left over for government revenues after dividend from the POMB is about 1.1 billion dollars. So we, the starting point is 4.6 billion dollars in spending, 2.4 billion dollars in um, uh, in uh, uh, revenues, that leaves a deficit. Numbers don't add because of rounding, but that leaves a deficit of about 2.3 billion dollars. So the first question is, how are you going to how are you going to how are you going to close that 2.3 billion dollar gap, which is which is roughly 50 percent, um, well exactly 50 percent of government spending. The next step that I've got in there is uh, uh, using uh, POMV 5050, going restructuring the, the PFD. From the current statutory PFD to just simply splitting the POMV draw, the SB 26 draw, 50/50. That's a that's something that Governor Dunleavy included in his 10-year uh, OMB plan last year as, as an option. Something Shelley Hughes has talked about. Something a lot of others have talked about. Something that I think is fair. That adds about 500 million dollars, about a half billion dollars that goes to government. Uh, splits the splits the POMV draw 50/50. Uh, and about a half million dollars additional goes to government. So revenues are now 1.3 traditional, 1.1 uh, statutory uh, current law, and add another 500 million in. That brings revenues to uh, uh, 2.9 uh, 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 and brings the deficit down to, to 1.8. So we've closed that gap. Then the next, then then the next layer is is a combination of two things, and this is where the rubber meets the road. You got 1.8 billion in in remaining deficit against the 4.6 billion dollar uh, spending cap. How are you going to close that 1.8 billion dollars? And in the chart that I've I've developed, I use two things. One is other revenues uh, to to raise a portion of it, and then spending cuts uh, uh, to do uh, to do the to do the final amount. And in the chart, I've got 1.3 billion in other revenues and 600 million in spending cuts because, frankly, I think that's probably the outer limits of what's politically possible um, in FY uh, 22, and that adds up to 4.6. But you know, people can argue about that. They can say, well, it ought to be 500 million in spending cuts, or it ought to be a billion in spending cuts, uh, and then the remainder is is you, you've got to find other revenues uh, to, to 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 fill up the remainder. The, the the sum and substance is at the end of the day you got to have 4.6. All of your components, uh, traditional revenues, uh, 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 current law uh, funds going to government after the PFD, whatever you want to do with PFD restructuring, uh, other revenues and cuts, it's all got to add up to, to 4.6. And I think the question is to candidates uh, is how do you get to 4.6? What's your alternatives uh, for getting to 4.6? And I think that uh, that is intended to put candidates uh, on the spot, frankly, about how they get to numbers. I, we have a lot of arm waving about, you know, we, we're going to do it through spending cuts, or we have a lot of arm waving around, we're going to do it through diverting um, uh, uh, property taxes from the boroughs, uh, up, we're going to upstream them up to the state, or we have a lot of arm waving about, well, we're just going to use the ERA. Um, okay, fine. Let's lay that on the table. Let's lay those. Let's put let's put numbers to those, and get to 4.6. And let's see what a candidate is proposing. And then we can start discussing whether that's realistic. Whether 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 realistically uh, uh, you can divert uh, property taxes from the boroughs. And if you if if the assessment is you can't do that realistically, that leaves a gap in that candidate in that candidate's proposal. But in some fashion, we've got to get the candidates to me. Or in some fashion, I've got to evaluate the candidates uh, on a on a common plane. How are they getting to 4.6? What is their uh, components to get to 4.6? And I think this is this this approach is probably the best pro approach, frankly, that I've come up with, or uh, uh, frankly, I've seen from from others about how to get the candidates on the same plane, explaining in detail what their what their what their particular. Uh, views are about how we get to, uh, to uh, a balanced budget in this state.
So you've been watching the field, you've been listening to people. Have anybody has anybody so far been answering this question to your satisfaction? Has anybody looked at this and said, two, you know, two point three billion dollar deficit? Here's how we're going to get there. Has anybody been answering that question to your satisfaction? Well, the only the only people who have really been answering it are the people who who propose PFD cut or PFD elimination, Be, because that raises that raises another uh, uh, billion six, and that really that really closes. Uh, closes the gap. So somebody like John Coghill, who says, I'm going to eliminate the PFD, or somebody like Natasha von Imhoff, who says, I'm going to eliminate the PFD. They've got plans. So so then the question is to voters, do you like that plan? Right. But you have to ask their opponents, what's your plan? If it's not, if it's not, if you don't want to eliminate the PFD, if you're opposed to that, what's your plan? Uh, and I think that's where the rubber meets the road. And I And I honestly have not seen candidates who oppose eliminating the PFD, I've not honestly seen any candidate put together a complete plan that gets to 4.6. All right. Well, we can use this chart at least as some kind of guideline or template to figure out exactly what those alternative revenues need to be or where else we need to cut or if it's even feasible to cut. Because we're talking about, even if we took the 50-50 POMV, we're still talking about a $1.8 billion cut. And uh, we had a hard enough time trying to uh, – we had a heart attack when the governor wanted to cut $800 million out, uh, and he didn't even get any of that. I mean, we ended up cutting, what, $80 million or something when it was all said and done and then adding some more in the next year anyway. So we, we really went nowhere. So Right. We, we, we haven't cut much at all in yep. the last three years. We're a, fact, we're a fact that we're over where we were, which is just disheartening. But uh, anyway, this is a good tool that you can use when talking to your candidates. If you're a candidate right now, I suggest you listen to this because – this is a this is kind of where the rubber, like you said, where the rubber meets the road. We've got to fill the hole. How do we fill the hole? Um, and uh, and I think that's the that's the big question there. Bill says the no income tax boat sailed years ago. The only question remaining is if we eliminate the PFD first. Um, I think that's probably I think that's probably a truth. Although it's a truth that I don't really want to face, and many of us don't want to face. But I think the chart kind of shows exactly what we're talking about here. Harold said, throw that chart in the trash. It doesn't include the oil industry. What say you? Uh, it does include the oil industry. That's where the $1.3 billion comes from. And if you look at over 10 years, uh, the $1.3 billion in traditional revenues come from. And if you look at over 10 years, um, uh, this there isn't enough money. You can't generate enough money by, by changing taxes on the oil industry uh, to fill up the $2.3 billion gap. Even Robin Brenna himself, doesn't claim that oil industry fixes are going to be are going to be 2.3 billion. Robin uh, says at most it's 1.2 billion, and that's based on that's based on $60 oil, and we don't have $60 oil. So, yeah, okay, fine. You know, put oil taxes in there. That doesn't that doesn't close the gap. Um, and and then we can evaluate a candidate on whether it's realistic to think we're going to get that from the oil industry and whether that's the right thing to do to take that from the oil industry. All right. So again, just just for argument's sake, let's go back to the chart real quick and say, so if we said oil industry increase, let's say that the, the thing passes and it's 1.2, it's $60 a barrel or what, 38 right now. So you're going to get $800 million or $700 million out of it, best case scenario, because that's what Brennan was, was putting forward. So we're still short about $800 million. Well, uh, it, it, uh, from the starting point, we're short, uh, if, it's, if it's $600 million or $800 million, we're short a billion and a, a, billion and a half uh, or a billion seven. I mean, the, the, the gap is $2.3 billion. Right. The starting gap is $2.3 billion. So if you want the statutory PFD to preserve the statutory PFD, you're still a billion and a half to, two, to a, a billion seven short. So you still have to fill up those those things uh, in there as well. So, yeah, no, okay. So uh, I see that. We see that. Could you please ask Brad what his thoughts are on where the ERA will be by the end of the year or maybe next year? So uh, go ahead and sound off on that, Brad. Well, the as of May 31st, and you can find all this information on the Permanent Fund Corporation website, uh, apfc.org. Uh, for those who want to follow these things. Uh, but as of May 31st, there was $63.7 billion uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the permanent fund. Um, of that, $46 billion was in, the, was in the principal, in the corpus, constitutionally protected corpus. $17 billion uh, was, is, is in the ERA. But 
the ERA, you, you you just can't say, well, that 17 billion is cash sitting there waiting to be waiting to be used. Of that seven of that 17 billion, um, uh, let's see, of that 17 billion, 7.8 billion, about 8 billion of it uh, was already committed uh, to uh, general fund appropriations money that. Uh, uh, the permanent fund under SB 26 uh, 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 gives to gives to uh, the legislature for appropriation four billion, uh, consistent with a bill passed by the legislature, uh, was committed to come out of the ERA at the end of the fiscal year, just about now, um, uh, and go into the uh, permanent fund corpus. Uh, 780 million was committed to uh, inflation proofing, uh, and on and on. So there was there was 7.9 billion that was already committed. That left uh, leaves something like uh, nine billion. Uh, of that nine billion, uh, about a billion and a half is unrealized gains, um, and that and unrealized gains are the, the way the permanent fund works is if they own a stock uh, and, it, and it appreciates, they mark to market. So they will have had uh, stocks that have gained 1.6 billion uh, that are assigned to the earnings reserve account. That's not cash. That's 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 book accounting um, uh, appreciation. If they sold as if they sold it today, right? Yeah. Uh, And so that leaves eight billion dollars in in realized earnings. That's uh, that's sitting uh, to the extent people talk about these things as cash, sitting as cash in the uh, earnings reserve account. Okay. So yeah, and and so that means that's a lot smaller than I think many people realize when it's all said and done. So seven billion of that is already accounted for for next year for this next fiscal cycle right eight, eight billion eight, eight billion eight billion for the next fiscal cycle leaving us with nine meaning if we hold true to that and we continue on into next year it could be another five six billion dollars that could be out of it so i mean literally we could be draining the era in two years if we continue down this path yeah, the ERA continually gets replenished with earnings coming off of the, the coming fund. off of the of the of the account. So it's always running somewhere in the five billion. Uh, generally speaking, it's always running somewhere in the five uncommitted. Always running five billion to seven billion in the uh, in the earnings reserve. But that's that's now that's now our savings. I mean, that's now our that's now our surge fund. So if we had an earthquake that that did very bad things to the state and we needed money we we really really have no place else to go right now uh other than the era and in the meantime that money is invested uh like the like the corpus itself and is generating returns so if you take that money out of the era uh you reduce future earnings um so there there's money sitting in there but it's certainly not as big as when as the headline number when somebody sees the earnings reserve has 17 billion dollars It's not that. It's something significantly smaller than that. Brad, final thoughts, 15 seconds here. The revenues have to come from someplace. Uh, Either we're going to cut spending by 50% or we have to have revenues. And it isn't just slight revenues. It's $2.3 billion. It's half the budget uh, in revenues. And so candidates candidates need to be confronting, to to be viable, in my opinion, candidates candidates need to be confronting and talking about how they're going to get... Uh, uh, what components are going to use to, to add up to 4.6. Uh, all right, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Brad, thanks for holding over with us into this hour. I appreciate you coming on and joining us. Where can folks find you? Uh, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets on uh, on Facebook or LinkedIn or, frankly, Twitter. Uh, it's um, uh, uh, but, but most of the stuff, the best way to get it is Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets on Facebook. All right, we've got links to that at the top of the chat room. If you want to click on the live video, you can click on through there as well. Brad Keithley, thank you so much for coming on board. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.